What is Dogma 95? It sounds dirty or disgusting, but it isn't. At least not always. So, when did it start? Why? Is it important today? Why are we talking about it today? Well, I'm Grant Burton, and today I'm going to answer all of those questions because this is Film Ed. <laughs> It's 1995. Two Danish directors, Lars von Trier and Thomas Winterberg, sitting down, having a few drinks one night and coming to a realisation. For the first time, anyone can make cinema. They decided that night that if that was to be the case, then some ground rules were needed. All of this was stemming from the idea or thought or suspicion that New technology, new gadgets and gizmos and special effects whiz kids and all that lot were going to democratise the film industry. So they wanted to return cinema to its purest form. Right now I'm filming this in 2021. So were their fears justified? Well, probably? Maybe? Yeah, perhaps. So they jotted down all of these rules into what they called a manifesto, which outlined everything you need for new avant-garde filmmaking. And they called it The Vow of Chastity. Again with the dirty sound and names. But here are the rules that they agreed to. On location filming. You couldn't do it in a set, you couldn't do it in a studio, it had to be in a real, factual location only using on location props. So if something was there while you were filming, guess what, that's in the film. Handheld cameras only. Direct sound recording only. So you couldn't insert music over the top of a scene, you couldn't add dialogue afterwards. It had to be there in the moment. A 133 one aspect ratio only. In colour, with no filters and no laboratory reworking. No genre films, so no superfluous action. No westerns, no horror, no comedy. It had to be real. Set in modern day. Again, couldn't put it in the past, you couldn't set it in the future. It had to be a contemporary piece of fiction. And the director had to be uncredited. And finally, the director had to make a pledge while making the film in, that they were not going out there to make a piece of artwork, but in fact, they were trying to force the truth out of the characters and the situation. So some of you right now might be thinking this all sounds a little pompous, a little silly. Well, it's worth reminding you, they came up with this while they were drunk. So how serious were they really being? Either way, they delivered this manifesto in 1995, but things didn't really pick up steam until 1998. It was the year when Thomas Vinterberg's film The Celebration and Lars von Trier's film The Idiots won awards at the London Film Institute. Both films followed the rules of the manifesto that they laid out. A year later, Soren Krog Jacobson released Mifune, which also followed the rules of the manifesto. It went on to be a financial hit and won several awards. And acknowledging the success of the films that were releasing that followed the rules of the manifesto, they created certificates. Because we all love these certificates. And basically, if a director or a film followed the rules of the manifesto, they would be rewarded a certificate which they then put in the film to just confirm that it was a Dogma 95 film. And it's worth saying that up to that point, a lot of the films released under the Dogma 95 manifesto were closely related to Lars von Trier's company, Zentropa. So a lot of people at the time felt that this was a bit of a publicity stunt more than anything else. Publicity stunt or not, it worked. To celebrate the new year, each of the Dogma filmmakers at the time, they went off and made a new film. But here's the catch. They released these films live on TV at the same time on the same day. So they aired on different channels of course, but the Dogma filmmakers encouraged the viewers to switch between the channels to create their own Dogma 95 film. How well that all worked out is beyond me, but it did work because one third of all of Danish TV viewers at the time were watching these films. 
Of course, with all the talk about it possibly being a publicity stunt, the directors were adamant that it wasn't, that it was real, that this was a movement that they truly believed in. They felt that the complex technology that Hollywood is investing their time and money in was really hampering the creativity of the films at the time and that they could challenge Hollywood by going back to basics. They wanted to capture the unrepeatable here and now. And the Dogma 95 filmmakers at the time had to make a vow confirming that the films they were making were more interested in the instant and that very moment rather than the whole around it. But how were these films made? Well, the actors and directors worked very closely together. They often didn't even have a script. They would show up on set or location as it was and they would just hamper out a scene there and then, coming up with it off the top of their head. For the film The Celebration, some of the actors even used the cameras behind the scenes. In Christian Levering's Lee is Alive, they filmed scenes with three cameras at once, so the actors had no idea when they were on screen. You have to imagine that for some of these films, many of the actors probably didn't have a clue what the hell was going on, or what substance the directors were possibly on. Regardless, Lars von Trier said that the formal rigidity of previous filmmaking really hampered his experience, and that this manifesto allowed him to free his creativity. Thomas Vinterberg, meanwhile, said, I had the impression that my way of filmmaking was imprisoned by conventions. Returning to standard techniques to make people cry, use artificial light for a night scene, there are things in cinema that you're supposed to do, and you do them without asking questions. It was stressed that all the Dogma filmmakers had to admit that they were making certain choices with their prior films, and that by adhering to this vow or this manifesto, whatever you want to call it, they could then relearn how to tell stories. But what resulted was a Danish film movement that came up with more dramas and romance films than anything else, because of course, you can't have genres. One more experimental film is Julian Donkey Boy, released in 1999. It's an American film. Yes, the movement was not just in Denmark. So Julian Donkey Boy focuses on this dysfunctional family, with the main character being Ju a schizophrenic who is concerned that his sister might be pregnant with his own son. Yes, you heard that right. To film this film, the director hid the camera in plain sight, putting them in the scenes themselves, often on top of tables or underneath lampshades and stuff like that, to hide them as best they could. However, Julian Donkey Boy did break one of the rules because it used non-diegetic sound by adding music over the top of the scenes. But the Dogma filmmakers let it off. Why? I don't know. Turns out you didn't have to stick to all the rules. Dogma films were ultimately made in Denmark, France, Italy, Spain, America and more. It wasn't just confined to Denmark, this was a real widespread film movement. All started from a drunken conversation that probably went too far. Today, in 2021, are there still Dogma films being made? Well, yes, sort of, but not officially. So who are the Dogma filmmakers of the day? Are Lars von Trier and Thomas Vinterberg still champion in this? Well, not exactly. Although it's worth saying that Lars von Trier, a very controversial filmmaker to this very day, is still pushing the conventions and boundaries of what films can be. But why talk about Dogma 95 today? Is it still relevant or important? Well, this, it's a mobile phone or a cell phone if you prefer. We all have one, some are better than others and most of them have cameras on them. The bottom line is that most of us can go out and make a film anytime we want. The films that we can make, some can be pretty amateurish, some will be better than others, some will look really bad but we can all do it. Dogma 95 might not be the big movement that it was in the 90s and noughties, but the fact of the matter is it's still highly influential. Most first time filmmakers will go out there and make a Dogma 95 film and not even realise it. It's just because they're limited by budget, scope and technology. When you look at Hollywood filmmaking for example, or just Western filmmaking as a whole, 
you'll see that CGI can recreate actors. We get huge, superfluous action scenes with explosions and exciting sequences. We're getting costumes and special effects that can take us into a different time period, different location. Films can trick us into thinking things are real when they're not. And there's oh so much more. Dogman 95 serves as a reminder that filmmaking is all about stories and it's all about characters. It's the industry around the films that's about entertainment. So that's something to think about as I end this show. And I am Grant Burton and this has been Film Ed. Thanks for watching.